How can India ensure nutritional security of our citizens? How will we fight climate change? Will we ever find out the origin of SARS-CoV-2? If these questions occupy your mind space, join a group of like-minded peers and understand the public policy underpinnings of Indian life sciences. Apply now for Takshashila Institution's four-week life science policy course, which begins from the 14th of September. Till then, enjoy this episode. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of All Things for Policy. Glad you could join us. Today we have uh, Dr. Nityanandam with us. He is the head of Takshashila's geospatial program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Nitya. Glad you could join us. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, it's my pleasure to join discussion with you. So, Dr. Nitya, you are here to talk about a really interesting topic today. Uh, we are going to be discussing heliports, specifically in the context of uh, Tibetan military landscape. Dr. Nitya, firstly. To give our listeners some context, how do these infrastructure developments like heliports in the Tibetan region affect India? Why should Indians care about uh, these developments? Okay, before I get into the uh, heliports and uh, its importance or uh, possible implications to India, perhaps I can start um, by explaining what is mean by heliport and how crucial it is as part of the role and infrastructure. Because most of the time, people can see things in news like the kind of uh, uh, you know fighter jets placed in different airports and air bases in uh, Tibet autonomous region and uh, the kind of infrastructure which are uh, you know uh, developed uh, in associated to this uh, air infrastructure so when when it comes to air power most of the time the news media news pieces covered the infrastructure development in air strips, either it's air strip or in you know air bases or in airports. You know, in this study, we have looked at the development uh, happened in um, heliports and uh, also on the helipads. So helipads are basically uh, a landing facility that is available, uh, you know, in uh, different parts of uh, Tibet Autonomous Region. And uh, in terms of heliports or a bigger infrastructure where you can have a strip for uh, landing this helicopter and uh, you have a space to service the uh, helicopters and you have additional infrastructure which is uh, useful for communication, which is useful for uh, other coordination and uh, even at times a couple of radars um, are even placed at this airport. Now, um, the purpose of the heliports and helipads are equally important because this acts as a, you know, technically as a node to uh, transport people, transport, uh, you know, other uh, machineries which are required uh, for people at different places, uh, especially soldiers at different uh, military barracks. And uh, these are all, again, a crucial component of air infrastructure, but often left out in the discussions. Now, when it comes to its importance to India, uh, since it is on Tibet Autonomous Region, as we know, the long-standing tension between India and China and uh, the rapid expansion of uh, PLAs, uh, you know, the Chinese army uh, in Tibet Autonomous Region, uh, is always a worry for India because over a period, the PLA is trying to minimize the gap that uh, we felt it as uh, uh, their disadvantage and uh, it is on our advantage. We have superiority in high altitude combats and things like that. Um, whereas the uh, what we can see in last uh, uh, one decade, I could say, is that development uh, happens in different parts of Tibet where those gaps are being, uh, you know, minimized. Now, any development on this uh, Tibet Autonomous Region closer to the line of actual control 
is closely monitored not only by India, by people across the globe. Now, what we have looked at even in the previous studies is like going from 100 kilometers inside the Tibet Autonomous Region from LAC, we explored the developments happened in terms of military, in terms of settlements, in terms of other road infrastructure in our previous accession at geospatial bulletin articles. So uh, in short, anything uh, happens in terms of uh, military development in Tibet Autonomous Region, especially within 100 kilometers from the LAC, uh, is always closely monitored. And it's very crucial for us to understand the developments on the other side. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nitya. So you have uh, studied over a hundred of these heliports, their locations, and in your geospatial bulletin edition, which I encourage our leaders to check out for some for amazing maps and visuals. Now, tell me, is there any uh, interesting patterns that you have identified in this study, and how are these heliports positioned, and uh, what does that tell us? Okay. So, uh, in fact, there are 100 plus helipads and, uh, you know, a few heliports. And an heliport may contain more than, you know, 5, 10 helipads also. Now, uh, when it comes to an interesting pattern or the placement in which it is uh, situated, what we can see here is if we have broadly classified, you know, the location of this infrastructure in four categories. One is, um, uh, you know, the helipads, which are mostly located close to significant infrastructure in, uh, uh, you know, Tibet Autonomous Region. When I say significant infrastructure, it could be a main city, it could be a major uh, military base, it could be a major infrastructure uh, where, uh, let's say, construction of dam in place or um, many other activities which are being conducted in Tibet. Second is strategic points near borders, like when it comes to uh, the border between uh, China and Bhutan, when it comes to border between uh, India and China, at crucial places, these helipads are placed. And um, again, in disputed areas, among the you know border areas, we have few disputed points. And even in these disputed areas, the helipads are located either close to it or sometimes even on to it. And, and at last, the fourth one is like it is located on major uh, logistic hubs. What does it mean is uh, it is placed at a, uh, at a location where the road infrastructure is limited or the connectivity uh, needs to be established to ad lift. On those places, we can see this uh, helipads and helipads. So overall, it is placed in location with significant infrastructure. It's placed in location where uh, strategic points uh, exist close to borders. It is placed in disputed and occupied territories where PLA presence is found and in places where uh, it can act as a major logistic hubs. Uh, but when it comes to pattern, what we can see is when we applied spatial analysis to look at the hotspots in the region, we could able to figure out the clusters are largely around on the four areas that I have said. And among those, the highest density in which the helipads are uh, placed are in an uh, area next to a capital town called Lhasa. So, um, you know, around Lhasa, we can see a number of helipads, perhaps. That's due to the fact there are two heliports in that region, which has taken maximum number of uh, helipads. And uh, interestingly, a set of cluster do exist close to Akshites in area um, which is again in a, a disputed aspect. So uh, the another cluster found close to Aksai chain is an interesting thing to note on. So these are the two predominant pattern we can uh, you know see on it. And the third important aspect is the elevation in which these helipads are located. So here we get a pattern in which uh, what is an elevation in which these uh, you know helipads and heliports are placed because. If you see the requirement of helipads and heliports in this region, uh, it is largely to minimize the gaps which are created on or always criticized being uh, PLA's um, you know, limitations and operations in terms of higher altitudes. So now these helipads are mostly placed 
in a range between 3,700 meters to 4,300 meters. And uh, though the, the elevation ranges from 780 meters to 2,600 meters, we can see majority of them are about 10,000 feet. So they are placed at locations where the access is required. However, the other modes of air infrastructure has limited operations on those regions. These helipads use as an alternative to serve, to establish connectivity at higher altitudes. So that's the beauty of uh, these heliports, which are placed with respect to altitudes. Okay. Uh, the way I am able to understand the heliports and helipads are that they are pioneering infrastructure, right? In very difficult terrains, uh, they provide immediate connectivity and some immediate access to the to any entity, the PLA or even for civilian uses. So how do you see these heliports and helipads evolve? Are they currently being used for helicopters predominantly, but do they have other uses that the Chinese can extract out of them? And how, how can they evolve in the coming years? See, uh, uh, you know, you're correct. Ideally, it is uh, for dual purpose, right? Even uh, civilians can use it at specific nodes to, uh, you know, move from one place to another or largely used by uh, military personnel to carry people, to carry uh, support mechanisms, to carry uh, machineries and to, uh, for, for many other activities. Now, what is actually happening there is um, a bit of uh, uh, slow development in terms of heli ports construction because uh, we know the helipads are numerous in different parts, uh, but with very few heliports in place. The heliports, again, are constructed in a way, you know, originally meant for certain types of helicopters. And uh, we all know there are certain gaps or challenges um, China faces in terms of rotary capabilities at high altitude operations. Because of that, I guess, the uh, priorities are changed over a period of time where, in my understanding, these heliports are not being constructed in a rapid pace where the air strips are constructed. Let's say the air strips or uh, airports and associated infrastructures are constructed in a much, much rapid phase compared to these heliports. Uh, one reason for that is these heliports, again, are uh, times kept in a very remote location, right? At times where, where uh, the priorities were given for a particular point has changed or, uh, you know, which has minimized or diminished, you can say, over a period of time. So because of this, some are still under construction and uh, very few are operational in the region. Now, um, we have identified it as operational or under construction based on the, uh, you know, the factors which you could figure out from the satellite imageries. People can read our uh, article for more details. And we picked out a few elements for interpretation. And then based on that, we have tagged it as a fully functional or under construction helipads. And again, that includes the kind of infrastructure the helipace has and the kind of development we can see, the full-fledged road network, vehicles on road, and uh, the number of buildings, uh, the serviceable apartments which are next to that area, recreational facilities, many factors that we have documented in our article. So, um, you know, in my understanding, they, the heliports are also available for their UAV operation because um, the runway lengths, um, the heliscript runway lengths have increased over a period of time. And if you can look at especially the developments after in uh, Doklam standoff and also whenever there is a clash that includes Galwan clash, we can see the the developments happens over a period of time and especially soon after those things. And uh, it is expedited after these uh, tough times. Now we can see the runway lengths are increased, which can easily accommodate their UAVs of certain categories and uh, which can be landed in uh, in a strip length less than uh, 1,000 meters. So uh, this indicates that um, the, the point of view or the thought process behind establishing the heliports looks like slightly 
uh, altered and it is um, you know it is just because of the things which are emerging in their local market and also the requirement of operations in the region so um, the pla is smartly uh, converting or you can say making use of the infrastructure as per the need and um, you know that's that's how you know one can make use of it in a better way rather than just uh, having it for a particular purpose okay can you talk a little bit more about what these uh, heli bases heliports and helipads are being used for have you taken a closer look at what these uh, infrastructure points contain and uh, can you give us a little little bit of context there yeah i can do that so um, you know though we have mapped hundreds of uh, helipads and few heli bases in the region if you refer our article we have only picked out eight settlement eight places where we can provide a different perspective of heliports and helipads to the readers so one of that is basically an established heliport in which you can see a large uh, heli strips and hangars and fairly established uh, you know uh, in associated infrastructure like include practice grounds accommodation for uh, you know possible people who are working in this uh, uh, you know heliports and uh, well connected highway infrastructure including uh, very big tunnel networks and uh, and many other factors like recreational facility indoor stadium and so on whereas uh, in couple of sites we have discussed in the article indicates that the infrastructures are uh, you know uh, under construction and you know it is likely to uh, get completed in couple of years but then while well, these are uh, you know coming up in a very slow phase but then these are also having um, you know a potential for expansion in this region if if we look at what we have not only looked at the heliports we have also looked at its surrounding infrastructure as i said uh, we looked at why it is placed on a particular location is it for a pure civilian activity or pure military activity or for dual purpose um, in one of that case um, uh, is a, a possible place where um, you know a new heliport can come and uh, currently we have two helipads over there is uh, site number 3 which we marked in the newsletter um, is very close to a sam site Uh, then we started exploring its adjacency and then we found out this place is at located at a little elevated area uh, compared to the nearby air infrastructure and nearby our uh, town so uh, you know this heli pads are established here clearly for a purpose of um, reaching out to the sam site in a in a quick time and again there are construction activities in place the lands are reclined and leveled it indicates that uh, perhaps it could be a potential place where a new heliport can also be developed so at present we have come to this conclusion by looking at you know the pattern in which the other heliports are evolved over a period of time and what kind of activities are being uh, you know conducted in this place so it is it is a place where we do not have an heliport but we uh we presume that there is a possibility that uh, you know heliport can be established here whereas in other side uh we have fairly old heliport which has been there for uh, a couple of years and uh, it is soon after uh, uh, the doklam clash the place was actually filled with so many uh, you know military infrastructure but today we can see the military infrastructure over there is uh, dissolved a bit but the helipads are there this is for say where 16 kilometers from uh, a doklam plateau and uh, it the infrastructure continues to be there but not to the level where we have seen during the uh, you know doklam crisis and uh, it is also very close to a sam site so now these helipads are there in remote locations wherever critical infrastructure military infrastructure exists and uh, another place uh, uh, where we have seen the helipads um, and heliports are again uh, expanded where the lands are leveled 
uh, in uh, site number five, which we described in our uh, article, uh, which is uh, closer to highway G318, close to Lhasa and uh, Nyangji uh, highway. So where the helipads are, you know, expanding in terms of number, the construction of uh, heliport is ongoing and even it is likely to be, uh, you know, expanded. As we can see, the lands are leveled, so which indicates that possibly, uh, you know, the, the, the expansion is very clear in this region. Um, in other places where the, uh, you know, so let's say the places close to, uh, you know, uh, Akshay Chin or places around uh, um, Pangong So Lake, where we can see the, the heliport are uh, equipped with uh, more facilities where, which enables the helicopters to land even at night. So the guiding facilities or guiding lights, approach lights are being placed at places where the 24 cross 7 operations are required. So those helipads are not something where the entire heliport does not have much of associated infrastructure because it is purely established at a remote location for military purpose. But uh, it, it has sufficient other ancillary infrastructures that require for fully functional heliports. So these are few Ashwin we have come across in our um, in our research, and we documented uh, with the help of high resolution satellite imagery where one can able to visualize the different things that we have figured out from our uh, research. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nitya. That was very interesting. And for our listeners, Dr. Nitya has uh, writes his open source geospatial investigative research in in his newsletter called the geospatial bulletin which i encourage all of you to check out for uh, it is a experience both visually as well as textually and uh, it's a lot of fun uh, dr nitya this has been wonderful uh, this was a really fun conversation uh, thanks for your time would you want to say anything as concluding thoughts yeah so um, you know though we have figured out many interesting things um, in and around this uh, helipo- helicopter infrastructure in this region. So we have shared some of this here, and I, I do agree uh, our newsletter carries a lot of uh, visual content and textual content, definitely uh, makes the audience interesting. And, uh, um, you know, it is one of the few uh, work that comes out uh, through the geospatial lens from our country. Perhaps readers may take a look at it. And uh, what I always also want to say is we have some interesting visuals on three-dimensional, you know, maps of these areas that can give a user a perspective on how these heliports and helipads are located in a in a natural context. If you look at the the topography in which it is placed, the kind of uh, relief features that it is surrounded by, one can able to see its purpose. Sometimes it is. Um, uh, hidden in a valley, sometimes it is located on a mountain top, sometimes it is located on uh, in a place where the the natural feature is uh, providing a cover. Sometimes it is backed up by a river on one side, sometimes it is surrounded by a mountain on three sides. So these are some interesting views one can able to get it when they look back into the heliports and helicopters. Um, what another thing we have uh, identified here in our study is more number of things which are so far documented by people in other uh, open domain in maybe you know this information perhaps available with uh, uh, you know uh, armed forces who are uh, more rigorously monitoring these developments in this region but whatever is published in open domain we definitely has more um, you know insights and we have identified more number of infrastructure which is spread out uh, in our um, you know in our vicinity so we also looked at the helipads carefully where it falls very close to our borders and especially very close to the disputed territories or you can say contested territories between india and china so the further monitoring would continue in our regular research because that is important to understand the development happens. Um, one last thing I would uh, say is like this helipads, when we look at as helipads or heli infrastructure, it gives a different message. But then if you look into it along with other research works that we have looked at, let's say mapping the road 
include the minor roads, railway networks, and other things. It definitely gives a different uh, understanding on the preparedness. Uh, especially um, these heliports are not just exist there for uh, you know a, a long distance uh, operation. These are basically looks like hop on hop off uh, kind of operation for taking things and then putting out in the next hub where that hub is still connected with many roads and railway networks to different parts. So um, to get an overall picture of military operation in Tibet, this helipads and heliports plays a crucial role and uh, constant monitoring of this would really help anybody who is interested on the development of uh, you know, military affairs in the region. So thank you, Ashwin. Uh, um, it has been a uh, pleasure to be uh, on your show and then uh, I will thank you all this episode. Thanks, Dr. Nitya. This was a really fun conversation. If you liked our show, dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs. Check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.